And as many of you know, River Network works with Groundwork USA as the coordinators of the learning network. And so we recently went through a um, series of regional calls where we got to hear from a lot of you um, who are grantees um, with the EPA Urban Waters Program and got to hear a lot of great projects going on around the country. So uh, this webinar and a number of webinars that will um, be held here in the next few months um, is our effort to bring various grantees together who are working across similar areas and share some of the best examples of um, the work that's currently happening under the umbrage of, of urban waters uh, small grants. Um, we, uh, Anne Marie and I, are busy. You might be very well getting a call from us um, here shortly to ask, are you willing to share your work? Um, in, in a similar format. So our goal is to have at least 10 webinars from here through late summer, probably a little bit closer to 12 or 13, um, and uh, just make the most of the fact that we have amazing work happening uh, by le being led by all the organizations here in the network. So um, this is our first one, uh, Urban Waters Outreach Engaging Minority Audiences. And so we have um, three great speakers um, three great projects, um, Beverly Woods, Alberto Rodriguez, and Cheryl Jenkins, um, who are going to be leading us through a brief presentation uh, of their projects. The way I want to facilitate this call is um, after each of the presentations, allow people to ask questions. And so that's why if you can call in, it would be better to do that. But if not, please just use the chat box on the left. Um, and then we'll just open it up because by no means are they the only three organizations or individuals who are trying to engage all pockets of, um, of folks in their watersheds in their work. Um, and so we want to hear what you're trying, what's working, what's not, what tools or resources you found helpful, anything we can glean that we can share with others and help disseminate good work um, is really the whole mission of the Learning Network. So with that, let me just ask our three presenters to introduce themselves, and then we'll turn it over to Beverly to lead um, lead in her presentation. So Beverly, you want to start with the introduction? I'm Beverly Woods. I'm the Executive Director at Northern Middlesex Council of Governments, and we're headquartered in Lowell, Massachusetts. Okay. Welcome, Beverly. Alberto? Uh, my name is Alberto Rodriguez. I'm a program manager with the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition, and we work here in Seattle, Washington. Great. And also that that corner of the country, Cheryl, in Idaho. <laughs> Cheryl Jenkins, and I know it's a stormwater program manager. We just had some restructure here within the city. Uh, I am now environmental compliance manager for for the city of Napa, but I still oversee the uh, the stormwater program. Uh, we are located here in uh, Nampa, Idaho. Great. Welcome to all three of you, and thank you all for, for being willing to, to lead on this. So um, Beverly, you want to take it away with your presentation, and you've got control of the slides. Thank you, Deanna. Um, our Urban Waters Project is called Restoring the Merrimack River by Connecting Communities Through Stormwater Education. And we're, we're undertaking this project in partnership with the Merrimack River Watershed Council. The purpose of our project is really to focus on developing new partnerships and testing messaging for stormwater in terms of the effectiveness of the message and the, the applicability of the message to different populations and age groups. Um, we're really looking to develop a stormwater education program that's effective for everyone. And we're, we're sharing our experience with people around the country so that you too can apply some of the things that we have learned to your projects and your needs. So as part of that initiative, we're creating a how-to manual that will lead people step by step through a process that they can uh, utilize for tailoring their stormwater message to their needs for their community or for their organization. And we're also developing a train the trainer program that will be available to organizations and municipalities um, throughout the country in terms of how you, you teach your staff or interested individuals on how best to develop their stormwater messages. 
Um, we're really paying special attention to low-income and non-English-speaking environmental justice areas in the city of Lowell. Um, we have a large minority population, and the entire city has been designated by the state as an environmental justice community. The important thing that we have found is it's very critical to really develop an in-depth understanding and an appreciation of the history and the culture of your, mem your community members. Um, Lowell is a gateway community. It has a long history of welcoming immigrants from around the world. We have a population of about 106,000 people, and of those, about 30,000 are Cambodians. Um, they arrived here from a culture of political persecution, and one of the great challenges that we have is that there's a large mistrust of government because of the experiences that they have had in their lives. But we also know that they have a really deep affection, and they feel very tied to the rivers. They, in, in Cambodia, they were very tied to the Mekong was part of their day-to-day -day lives. And they feel that way actually about the Merrimack as well. And many of them come from an agrarian background. They have a great love for the land and an appreciation for their environment. We have a lot of very recent immigrant populations in the city as well that include Burmese, um, African, and Iraqi refugees who have fled war torn countries and have had similar experiences to the Cambodians and that same mistrust of government exists. Um, as part of our contract, we've established uh, 13 existing partnerships. Probably one of the most important is with a, an organization in Lowell called the Cambodian Mutual Assistance Association. And this organization really is devoted to assisting recent immigrants with learning English, um, helping them with job training. And they really have built a relationship of trust with people um, involved with their organization. And right now, they're serving not only the Cambodian immigrants, but also many of the other recent immigrant groups in the city. So we've partnered with them. Um, we've used their meetings as a way to reach out to that population. We also are working with a newspaper that's a Hispanic bilingual newspaper called Rumbo. And they've been publishing articles on our project and also with Mill City Grows, which is a fairly recent nonprofit in Lowell that was formed um, to address urban agriculture. They've established a number of community gardens throughout the city. Many of the people participating in their community gardening program are also um, part of the minority community that we're looking to reach out to. Um, we're working with the Lowell National Historical Park. We have an urban park here in Lowell that is really focused on industrial history and the history of the Industrial Revolution. They have a number of youth programs that we've been able to work with um, in terms of, of getting some input from the young people who live in, in the city and who visit the city. We're also working with the Lowell Parks and Conservation Trust, which is a nonprofit land trust in the city. And we're trying to also pull the business community into our project. And we have accomplished that through the, the Greater Lowell Chamber of Commerce. And then we're working with several of the municipalities that surround Lowell as well to, who don't have large minority populations, but certainly have a lot that they can contribute to messaging stormwater. We're right now looking to form a partnership with an organization called the United Teen Equality Center. That is a nonprofit in the city that focuses on at-risk youth, and they are very involved in anti-gang initiatives. We're trying to in engage some of those teenagers um, in our stormwater program. And um, you know, we're hoping that we'll be able to, to make a difference in their lives through the work that they're going to be accomplishing. And then we're working also with the Coalition for a Better Acre, which is the community development um, organization for the neighborhood in Lowell that is truly the lowest income neighborhood in the city. Uh, we've, we really feel it's very important to go directly to your target audience with your message. And we've found that the most effective venues for doing that involve taking advantage of local meetings and events that are already occurring and asking to be a part of that. And Lowell, we're very fortunate in that the entire city is carved out into neighborhood organizations. And we've attended the meetings of the neighborhood organizations, and we've presented a lot of our messaging concepts to them to get some feedback. Um, we've also taken advantage of a great 
event that we have on the Merrimack River here in Lowell every August called the Southeast Asian Water Festival, which attracts about 30,000 people a year. Uh, we did a lot of leafleting at that event, and we had a table there to get some feedback from folks, and that was very successful. Similarly, there's an African festival also on the river. And then the congresswoman every year from our district has River Day, where she travels up and down the river, usually by boat or canoe, and has different press events at various locations, including Lowell. And we um, were part of that event. We talked about our Urban Waters Grant, and we also talked about it up in Lawrence, which is a little further east on the river. And in Lowell every year, there's a Lowell World Cup, which is a local soccer tournament put together um, by soccer groups and soccer clubs representing different ethnicities in the city. And it's um, a great event, very well attended. We've used that as a venue. We have worked with the Lowell Charter School, and we took a group of fifth graders around the city. We showed them catch basins and outfalls in different parts of the stormwater infrastructure. And then they came back to their classroom, and they wrote a little essay about what they saw and what they thought they could do as individuals to improve the quality of, of water in the city. And we also have been engaging some of the recreational organizations that use the river. There's the Merrimack River Boating Program, and they've been involved in the project as well. Um, we have found that it's most effective to deliver your message in the language of the, the group that you're working with. Um, we're fortunate in Lowell that many of the neighborhood meetings are already set up with translation services, and we've been able to utilize those. And the Cambodian Mutual Assistance Association has provided us with some translation services um, as their contribution to our project. And we also learned very quickly that it's really important to understand and respect cultural differences. And I'll give you a good example of that. One of our stormwater messages was a graphic that really talked about the economic benefits of properly managing stormwater. And one of the graphics had money burning. And the Cambodian community immediately said to us, you cannot use that graphic. In our culture, that is the ultimate insult to burn money. <laughs> so we quickly um, learned that you really have to understand what is important for each culture. Um, the, the effectiveness of particular messages really varies differently based on age and cultural differences. We have found that for young people, humor is really important to them. And all of the messages that we showed that had some kind of humorous context really appealed to them, and they felt that it's something that their peers would pay attention to and something that, that they would find most effective for their group. And the other thing that we've found is that no matter where you come from in the world or what age you are, you want to leave the, the world a better place for your children and your grandchildren. So any message that appealed to stewardship was highly effective for all age groups, for all ethnicities, for all cultures. Everyone felt that that was really the most effective message for them and something that could be applied and tailored for any population. So that's really a snapshot of, of what we had done. Um, our schedule for completing this project is, is that we'll be, we'll be through this summer. We're now in the process of putting together the how-to manual and the train the trainer program. We have a number of um, graphics and messages that we have created that we're setting up in a, a way that um, we can put them on our website and people can pull them off and they can tailor them for their own individual needs. Um, one of the good things that came out of this project is as we started to work with our local communities it became very evident that there was a desire for them to work with one another. So we have now formed a regional stormwater collaborative, which includes um, our nine member communities plus four other communities. We were able to leverage some state funding for that. And that group really is focusing on developing a public education program that can be used on a regional basis for all populations and on actually doing some procurement of stormwater services 
in um, somewhat related equipment, and they've really come together. They meet on a Monday basis now in our office, and it really does seem that they're very serious about, about doing the best that they can to, to deal with stormwater. So this has really been a great grant for us. It's allowed us to really get the message out there, and it really um, has, has led to things that we never imagined that it would in terms of communities collaborating and working together. All right, thank you, Beverly. We asked the speakers to keep their presentations brief so that we could have plenty of time for questions. So let me now um, open it up if there's questions now for Beverly on her particulars. Um, and you can do that verbally or over the chat box. This is Charlene with Galveston Bay Foundation. Um, I just had a question um, regarding <laughs> the uh, ever attractive topic of poop. <laughs> um, you know, that's something that we all deal with, you know, whether it be pet waste or um, for us over here we deal a lot with boater waste and um, sanitary sewer overflows. So obviously you don't use like all those terminology for general audiences, but I was just curious, culturally speaking, um, we use a lot of humor in that, um, especially like you said with the youth, but is there any like cultural concern? Because I know a lot of these um, people may have, may have come from areas that uh, lack certain types of sanitation um, infrastructure, and did, was there any, you know, concern with that topic in particular? Um, there really wasn't, there was, we do have some messages that we developed that are on that topic, and I think they're all focused on humor. We have a, you know, mm -hmm. a, a dog with a broom scooping up its own poop and that, that uh -huh. sort of thing. Yeah. And, and those things were, were well received. I think in terms of the understanding of the importance of stormwater, one of the things that, that we learned is that largely for the Southeast Asian community in Lowell, there really wasn't any basic understanding of how stormwater infrastructure functions. And mm -hmm. that's because for the most part, they, you know, they came from a country where there isn't any stormwater infrastructure. Right. And there has been some education involved in terms of getting them to understand that when you wash your car and the soapy water goes into the storm drain, it then goes into you know, the river, which applies your drinking water. So these are not things that they have thought about. So part of what you need to do to create an effective message is to first get them to understand the issue. So when we did our project, the first meeting that we had with them, it really was just a little tutorial on what is storm water and why does it matter. And we kind of tried to sort of plant those ideas in their minds and said, we're, we're looking for a way to, to get you and, and your friends and family to understand why it's important to protect the water and what it is you can do to improve water quality by better managing stormwater. And then we came back to them with the messages. And then they provided some input to us in terms of changes that they thought that we should make that would make the message more effective for them. But it's certainly just developing a very basic understanding of what is stormwater and why it doesn't matter is really the first step. Thank you. I, I see that even with people who have grown up with it. So <laughs> it's kind of a common issue. Um, I guess I wasn't sure if there were any stigmas or anything. Um, I just know from a little bit of knowledge of um, when you're actually over in developing countries, I've heard sometimes the stigma of, you know, gross topics like waste and sanitation can be um, a barrier to the message. I didn't know if there was any um, problems with that when um, people come over here to um, areas with different um, infrastructure. Yeah. Not that we have observed. We, we mm -hmm. didn't really okay. have that, that issue. Great. Thank you. Other questions for Beverly? Can you talk a little bit about the products? Are these all uh, brochure, fact sheets, written materials, um, video? What, what what are the products where you're putting these messages? Um, the products are some brochures and also poster-like products that um, folks could use to either you know, put on the wall of the library or their town hall or eight and a half by eleven size 
um, graphics that could get integrated into a report. For example, in this area, the water departments in all of our communities send out quarterly reports on mm -hmm. the state of the, their drinking water quality. So we have some that are in a small enough size that they could be reduced and made part of that report, and they can have a little section in there about stormwater. In many cases, the, the water departments or the engineering departments in each community are the ones that are responsible for overseeing the stormwater program as well. So we have an, a number of different formats and styles. They're not videos. They're, they're mostly either brochures, pamphlets, uh, posters or just graphics that can be inserted into other documents. Great. And there's three questions lined up. I don't know if can you see them, Beverly. Are the materials available, the trainer for trainer, or some of the materials you're talking about? Um, or could you share them through, say, Basecamp with the rest of the? Um, we could certainly share some of them. Some of them are still kind of being massaged, but we could share them through Basecamp. That that would be great. Um, maybe we can have Clint from EPA follow up with you if you have not uploaded stuff before. Um, I know he's listening in as well. Um, sure. To help you do that. And then a couple of other questions. How did you measure the effectiveness of your messaging, and have you worked with social media at all? Um, well, we we do have a Twitter account and a Facebook page for this program. We're in the process now of uh, putting together a website as well. We just hired a website designer actually a couple of weeks ago, so that's work in progress. But the effectiveness really was measured um, at the community meetings that we had, and we would basically show an image and ask for feedback and ask for people to raise their hand if they thought this was an effective message. And we statistically analyzed the feedback that we received based on the responses of the audience that we were showing the messages to. Great. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Beverly. Um, let me um, now turn it to Alberto. If you have other questions, Beverly, let's come back to those at the end of the three presentations. Um, and we're going to move all the way across the country to Duwamish, um, Seattle, uh, to hear about this project from the DRCC. Alberto, you want to take it away? I can do that uh, easily. Um, so my name is Alberto Rodriguez. And again, I'm a program manager with uh, the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition. Uh, we're a very small nonprofit. And um, our, our mission is to ensure a Duwamish River cleanup that is accepted and that benefits the community and is protective of fish, wildlife, and human health. And we're actually the community advisory group to EPA regarding the Duwamish River Superfund site, and we are also the technical advisory group to the communities, the affected communities. So basically how I normally put it is we're like the middlemen, you know, like sometimes decision makers, agency representatives don't talk the same language both figuratively and literally, you know, from uh, uh, you know, with the, with the affected communities, and vice versa. So we kind of like uh, manage that information, you know, and share it. You know, we take the, what the community wants to see and their opinions and their concerns to EPA and other decision makers, such as uh, elected officials. Uh, and then, you know, the technical information sometimes put by ecology or EPA regarding the Superfund site, we make sure that the communities get it in a, in a, in a way that they can understand and that they can use. Um, let me jump in. And, if you could try and speak up a little bit. I know you're coming through a little faint on this end. OK. Uh, is that better? Um, a little okay. bit. Maybe get close to your speaker, yeah. It's better. Oh, much better. OK, good. I'm just going to have to hold my phone while I speak uh, okay. close to my face. Um, so, um, so well. So we're basically that organization, you know, the technical advisory group to the community, we're the community advisory group to EPA, and just bring information to both both of these uh, interested parties and stakeholders regarding the Duwamish River Superfund site. Um, and, you know, this is a photograph of the northernmost uh, part of the Duwamish River and the Duwamish Valley. Uh, you can see downtown Seattle in the uh, background and Elliott Bay, you know, to the on the top left corner. Uh, and, you know, this can give you an idea of how heavily industrialized the uh, Duwamish Valley is. And it's because of this, because of one more than 100, 100 years of industrial legacy, that the river is extremely polluted. And it contains uh, more than 40 
chemicals that are above human health and environmental health standards um, that need to be cleaned up. Um, and you know, as you might know, this affects the ongoing, you know, the historical pollution of the river, the existing pollution in the river, and the ongoing pollution affects uh, certain communities disproportionately. You know, more so than others. Uh, some of the most impacted communities are, you know, low-income low residents from the two neighborhoods that sit along the shores of the Duwamish, South Park, and Georgetown, and. Uh, a lot of these residents are recent immigrants from many, many, many recent immigrant groups. Uh, the biggest one being the Latino or Hispanic, you know, uh, that maybe makes more than 40% of the community in South Park in one of the neighborhoods. Uh, the Vietnamese community is very big, uh, but basically anything you want to find, you'll, you'll find it in South Park and in Georgetown. Um, some of these recent immigrant groups, you know, um, also go fishing, uh, sometimes just for fun, you know, because of cultural reasons, or uh, there's a lot of subsistence uh, fishing happening on the river. Um, and also, there's two tribal nations that have fishing treaty rights on the Duwamish, the Muckleshoot and the Suquamish. And um, there's a third one, actually, the Duwamish, that's uh, fighting for federal recognition as we speak. Um, so those are affected. Uh, but in the end, you know, the pollution on, in the Duwamish River affects everybody in Seattle because it's Seattle's only river. Um, and uh, the Duwamish River was identified as a Superfund site um, in 2001. Um, and EPA, as you might know, is the agency that oversees you know, and enforces the cleanup of Superfund sites. Uh, and it uh, took them 12 years to come up with a cleanup plan for the Superfund site. And I'm going to talk about what we did during the public comment period you know, for the proposed plan to engage you know, minority groups that are being affected by the pollution in the Duwamish River. Um, so I want to start with, you know, if you want to seriously um, engage a diverse constituency, you know, and many, many of these minority groups, you will have to build really, really diverse and many, many partnerships. Things, you know, groups that I never thought I would be working with, uh, you know, we did. And we had really, really uh, great success. Um, during the public comment period. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But, you know, just partner with faith-related groups, you know, artist groups, um, many nonprofits, educational institutions, small businesses, community groups, neighborhood associations, you know, PTAs. Um, cast your, your net widely. Um, and uh, also, you know, you need to have a very diverse work plan, you know, a work plan that seriously caters to the interests to the concerns and values of uh, these uh, minority groups. And uh, you know, in the case, we actually had, we hosted five formal public hearings you know, in conjunction with EPA and the Department of Ecology. Um, the RCC and other partners actually hosted 16 unconventional uh, public meetings and community workshops regarding the cleanup of the river. Uh, we presented for 25 different community groups. And we actually attended or hosted um, five unconventional community events. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, all of that we did in 105 days, which was uh, the window you know, to actually get public comments from the community and the community section. Um, so the first one I want to start with is you know, some of the community events that we attended and hosted. Uh, the World Dance Party is actually what it sounds like. It's a party. It's for fun. You know, it's actually a potluck where uh, community members bring their food uh, from you know, their different places of origin. And we actually um, pick or recruit that's the word, um, six to eight dance instructors that will teach a dance from these uh, places, you know, from many, many different cultures and, and, and countries. And they teach a dance, and then the community shows up, everybody stands up, and they dance, and, and it's amazing. Uh, so this is actually an event that was put together by another, by other groups in southeast uh, King County, or, you know, southeast Seattle. Uh, the river is actually in southwest. But um, we've been part, the RCC has been part of the planning committee, and then we decided that it was time to maybe move the World Dance Party to the southwest King County. And because of that relationship that we had built with um, 
some of these groups that put together the World Dance Party. They were up for it. And actually, the one and only rule about the World Dance Party is that there's no agenda. It's just for fun. But uh, they made the exception this one time, and they allowed me to give my feel about you know, the cleanup of the river and how to fix everybody. And I hosted a table there, and people were seriously interested, you know, and they provided comments right then. Um, so, you know, just to them, you know, and, and make it in a fun way, you know, in, in a way that seriously interests some of these uh, minority groups. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is some of the presentations that we did. Um, some of these minority groups are really well organized. Um, the, the, the group that comes to mind is the Filipino Association here in Seattle. You know, I was able to uh, request um, and present uh, at their board meeting. And the board was extremely interested in the issue because, you know, there is a Filipino community uh, fishes a lot. And, um, and some of their community members fish on the Duwamish River. So they actually allowed me to present. And then they wrote a comment letter, you know, as a Filipino association, you know, um, supporting the RCC's efforts in a better cleanup of the river. So, you know, just do your homework and figure out, you know, uh, how some of these groups are as a way or the other. Um, then I'm going to start getting the unconventional public meetings in the realm. Um, we normally put together boat tours and we take people out and tell them the story of Seattle's home river, you know, and how polluted it is, you know, how it's getting better, you know, what people can do to make it better and cleaner. Um, and we call these, you know, boat tours floating classrooms. So uh, this, when we put this out, you know, the boat tours filled super quickly. And, you know, I have a really good contact with the Vietnamese community uh, in the Duwamish Valley. And, you know, my goal was to actually engage maybe 30, 35 Vietnamese community members, take them on a boat tour, uh, tell them about what's going on and all these things. And um, actually, after two days, and he started spreading the word, he's a boat tour uh, or boat tour Vietnamese community of other people. Uh, Alberto, I don't know what's going on, but you're breaking up. I don't know if you are on a cell phone. I'm on a cell phone. I don't have a landline where I am. Okay, okay. Let's I'll, go ahead. Go ahead. You sounded better just now. Okay. Um, so I was talking about you know the uh, success story with the Vietnamese community uh, in the Duwamish Valley. Um, you know. I was hoping for to engage 35 community members. You know, two days later, I had 100 people signed up for the boat tour, and the day afterwards, my contact, you know, Peter Quenguen, was like, I had to cut it off, and we have 120 people that want to go. So, you know, it's very interesting. Make it fun. You know, um, it was a really good way for people to see the river and what's really happening, you know, to smell the river, to see the river, to actually almost touch the river. Um, this was very, very uh, successful uh, as a community engagement uh, tool. Um, then another unconventional public meeting and workshop is a multilingual uh, workshop that we put together. We partner with the local elementary school uh, that caters to, you know, like the Duwamish Valley. Uh, Duwamish Valley is super diverse. Um, we actually recruited community leaders, you know, community members from within uh, the area to be the presenters. So they were, we trained them, and they were talking and presenting to their neighbors and peers. And that was very empowering to them. They also recruited people to come, uh, and the community really appreciated that. Um, something that's key in all of our events is that we always have food. Um, we try to have something to compensate people for their time and expertise. And this one time, um, the Seattle Aquarium actually donated tickets to go to the aquarium to everybody that showed up to that workshop. People loved it. Um, and this was actually our most successful um, workshop or uh, event where we got actually comments uh, regarding the cleanup of the river. because. I want to say that more than 90% of the attendees actually wrote comments and handed them in that very same day uh, in four different languages. So it was very empowering. Um, you know, there are some pictures of the 
night of, you know, we had some activity for the kids. We were actually taking pictures, uh, doing photo comments that we submitted as comments to EPA. Uh, people love those as well. Um, and the other unconventional public meeting I want to talk about is the Duwamish River in 3D. This was a lot of fun, but a lot of work. Uh, we actually built a 50-foot model of the river, and we made it very visual, you know, like, uh, what was at stake, you know, what EPA was proposing, what the community wants to see, uh, what was at stake with institutional controls and dredging and capping, you know, the, the actions that EPA is proposing to clean up uh, the Duwamish River. Um, we had six different stations. Again, community members were presenting to their neighbors and peers, food, tickets to the Seattle Aquarium. Uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful event. You know, it was fun. We actually built the model uh, inside an indoor beach volleyball field. So it was a lot of fun. People were playing all over the place. Um, and that's how the river kind of looked like. Um, that's a photograph of, you know, how we managed to put it together, the model. Um, and some photographs as well of the night. Um, some of our volunteers talking, you know, more photo comments. Uh, and the comments corner where people were actually, um, they had different options on how to provide comments that mm -hmm. day. And um, public hearings, you know, uh, these are the formal public hearings that EPA and Ecology hosted. Um, I'm very proud to say that, uh, to my knowledge, this was actually the first time that a formal public hearing has been hosted in a language other than English. We convinced EPA to host it in Spanish because, you know, we cater to a big Spanish-speaking population. Uh, you know, the simultaneous interpretation that we normally provide for Spanish speakers or Vietnamese speakers, this one time was provided to English speakers. So all agency people, everyone that spoke English, had to wear the funky headsets that we normally wear uh, during the formal public hearings. That was very eye-opening to actually the agency staff, and I hope that it's replicated all over the United States. Um, so one of the things, and then, you know, after you've done all these unconventional, you know, very fun ways of engaging the minority groups in the community, uh, when it comes to some of these formal public hearings that normally people don't like to attend, they're very well informed and engaged and educated, and they do attend those meetings. Um, this is actually one that we hosted in Georgetown, one of the neighborhoods. Uh, we hosted two meetings at uh, two different times of the day. Um, it's the first time that we have provided uh, simultaneous interpretation in Vietnamese, and that has been used. We had like 25 or 30 community members that showed up. Um, and something that's very dear to my heart as well is that we, that day, people gave public testimony in four different languages. You know, they stood up and they talked in their native languages, you know, in English and Spanish and Vietnamese. If someone from the Duwamish tribe give public testimony in the should see um, Okay, you're breaking up again, Alberto. If you could move, I don't know. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, is that better? You sound much better, yeah. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Um, so we had really good results. You know, we engaged more than 3,300 people in all of our activities, you know, boat tours, presentations, public hearings, meetings, et cetera, right? And more than 1,200 of those people actually showed up to one of the workshops or public hearings that Ecology or EPA hosted. Um, we collected more than 2,300 comments in 10 different languages. Um, and I actually hand-delivered 1,900 of those to EPA. So at least I know that 1,900 of those are asking for a better cleanup of uh, our river. Um, so we had really good results. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Hopefully you were able to listen to me while I was talking and I didn't break up. Yeah. All right, so a little bit of a different project. This is bound by a timeline for public comments. So in three months, um, an amazing amount of activities, culturally sensitive, sensitive to language. Um, let me open it up for questions. I see there's at least one person typing. Um, questions or thoughts from Alberto? 
All right, so what's the capacity? I mean, three months, you guys did a lot of work. I, I guess, um, you know, broad, casting a broad net, yes, but how do you manage that with the limited capacity that you have? Um, so if you could talk um, about how you manage yes. to pull this much off. So, you know, just so you have an idea, we're a very small nonprofit. It's only two of us full time, you know, the executive director, James Rasmussen, and myself, which I'm the program manager. Uh, we have a part-time person who was the founder of the organization, BJ Cummings. And back then, last year, because we had some funding for other uh, healthy communities projects, we had Paulina Lopez as a uh, half-time. You know, she was working part-time. And our administrative assistant, Ruben, uh, working a quarter of a time. So um, you know, it came to the point in which all of us knew that this was the most important time in the history of the organization. You know, our work that we've been doing for 12 years was basically not coming to an end, but it was like the, you know, like the, uh, gosh, like the, the most important point in our history. And we went insane. And, you know, there were a lot of 14-hour days, um, working seven days a week. Um, and... Uh, what was key also was the partnerships, you know, like partnering with artist groups, partnering with the school, partnering with community leaders, yeah. with other nonprofits that made our life a lot easier. Um, but again, we, we had to put a lot of hours and sweat and tears and blood into this. So I was able to take a month off, you know, after this was done and I went home. I'm originally from Honduras, so I went home, saw my family relax at the beach. Um, but yes, it's, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Um, all right. Yeah. Sun says, EPA is able to provide bilingual translation services. Wow. To grantees interested in this kind of support. Wow. That's great to hear. I did not know that. Um, and who was providing those in the Duwamish, um, all these Simultaneous. You know, for, Go ahead. Formal public hearings. Oh, I'm afraid we can't hear you, Alberto. Um, let me go ahead and uh, maybe if you can type that answer while I turn it then, um, just in the interest of time, to our last speaker, again, focusing now on stormwater in uh, Nampa, uh, Idaho. So we've got Cheryl Jenkins. Um, Cheryl, you want to take it away? Oh, and I, was well, I don't know what to say following on the heels of those projects. You know, <laughs> I will try my best here. I've been impressed so far. Good, good work, everybody. Um, uh, City of Napa, Idaho, uh, uh, we're in our first permit cycle for our MS4 permit. We're currently in year five. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Idaho is under EPA primacy uh, for the NPDES permits in our state. So um, whereas a lot of programs are directed by the state, uh, ours is directed by EPA. So uh, within our um, stormwater MS4 permit, of course, as most of you know, there's six minimum measures that uh, the city is required to develop and implement. Um, the first uh, minimum measure being public education and outreach, uh, and the second being a public participation um, and involvement. Um, the city um, stormwater staff is pretty small. Uh, we started out with just myself, and I added a, a few other people who did other things uh, for the stormwater permit. But I quickly began to realize that uh, I am not an expert in public education and outreach quickly realized that um, in order to reach the people in our community, one, we need to know who our audience is, you know, who are the members of our community. Um, we need to recognize the unique needs of our community, you know, how do we uh, implement this uh, minimum measure and meet the needs of our community. And uh, we quickly became to realize that we are not experts. So we thought, putting on our thinking caps, well, who are the experts in our community? And, and we, we came up with, um, well, the local teachers uh, are really the experts in our community. So we um, um, 
we kind of drafted some preliminary plans on to uh, incorporate the Napa School District in our public education and outreach. And then we began to realize the unique needs in our community uh, is the, the cultural differences. You know, um, Nampa is approximately 83,000 people, um, but we didn't really know our community, so we uh, incorporated a, um, a demographic study. And as a result of that demographic study, it indicated that uh, approximately 23% of the community members are Hispanic or, or Latino. And at that point, um, none of the members on our staff spoke uh, or um, had any knowledge of the, the written um, Spanish language. Uh, we decided that we wanted to get together the uh, community members in, in Napa that represented the Hispanic and Latino community, and we had a focus group. Uh, the members of the group, there's about 10 members in this focus group. Uh, they ranged anywhere from uh, high school kids all the way up to uh, uh, the professionals in our community. And as a result of this focus group, uh, we came up with the, the name of someone uh, in our community who is well respected, uh, who could be our li liaison between the city and the, the local Hispanic community. Um, Hoka Velez uh, uh, is, is that community member here, and she is very passionate about the Hispanic community. She's very passionate about the environment. And we were fortunate enough to run across Hoka as our, as our liaison. Uh, the um, results of our program here probably would not, uh, that I'm going to discuss today, probably would not have taken place without the um, the events that took place at all, the stars fell a line and we were able to uh, move this project down the road. Uh, the first being that I was contacted by a, a local EPA agent out of Boise who offered me $10,000 if I would um, incorporate uh, engaging the underserved community member here in Napa, which is the Hispanic and Latino speaking community. and. Um, the Indian Creek, which runs right through uh, the middle of Napa. And I agreed. I said, yes, I will, I will take that money. So we received $10,000 in an Urban Waters grant. That's the Urban Waters Initiative. Um, that initial money was used to do a research on what we needed to do to reach the Hispanic community. Um, we took that, um, that data and we found out that about six, eight, 6.8% of the Napa residents uh, over the age of five speak English uh, less than very well, meaning they had some knowledge of English, but you know it was very hard for them to understand anything, especially technical data, which uh, we were talking about stormwater and keeping pollutants out of the storm drain. And mm -hmm. it was hard to get the, the message across in English when they didn't understand that. And, um, 27% of the individuals living in, in uh, our part of the, our, uh, the southern half of the city, which is our target area, had a very limited English proficiency. Um, we also realized that Nampa is a young city. 30 is the median age in our community. And in order to reach most of the community members, we need to, we need to reach the younger crowd. You know, they're the ones that are most open. They're the most ones acceptable um, to change. and. Um, they're the ones that spend the time outside. They, they play, they, they go to school, and they walk to school. And so the younger community um, uh, in, our, in our area, we felt like would grasp the, the, call, the knowledge and the concepts more. Once we formed our focus group, some of the recommendations that we had uh, was to involve uh, the Hispanic and Latino community members here here in Napa. Um, the ideas that we took from the uh, the community members uh, formed our partnership with Hoka. Um, Hoka did a lot of groundwork. She did a demographic study. Uh, she compiled a directory here in Napa of all of the um, uh, Spanish speaking organizations, all the Spanish spe speaking professionals. All of the groups that that we could um, we could outreach to uh, all the media, uh, the newspapers, the radio stations, and she set us up with a lot of the um, the um, events that we attended. Now, 
when we attended these events, um, we had uh, fact sheets that we had developed that were originally developed in English. So what we did is we contracted a, a local translator who translated those documents um, in, in Spanish. And one lesson that we learned um, on translating those, um, those documents was to use a local translator. Uh, the dialects, especially in the, um, uh, in the Spanish-speaking community, the dialects change from area to area. So uh, we kind of learned the hard way that we needed to focus on, on the local dialect, making sure that the dialect was understood. And, and to keep things simple, uh, when they're first starting um, to learn English and to learn the concepts, we needed to keep the, um, the content simple and to put a lot of pictures in to, to convey our message. And we, we found out that um, um, the community members here who spoke Spanish really were eager to learn English. Uh, and so when we were developing our website, we did put the, the Spanish and the English side by side. So uh, their children who are going to school who could understand English could show them the, the English side and the Spanish side. And at that point, they could, um, they could learn English. And they were, they were very willing to learn English. And they were very appreciative of the fact uh, that we put those side by side so um, they could understand English. Mm -hmm. And um, to reach the younger kids in our community, we developed a partnership with the Napa School District. Um, we decided to take advantage of the talent of our, our local teachers. Um, there's no one on my staff who can claim to be a professional educator. So we incorporated um, uh, the curriculum in, in the local school districts. We worked with a team of stormwater teachers to incorporate stormwater education into in existing curriculum. We did target the fifth grade, the eighth grade, and the high school levels. Uh, uh, the fifth graders, uh, we would buy supplies for them to um, uh, to an edible aquifer project. I'm sorry, is that ringing into your side over there too? It, just a little bit, yeah. I'm sorry, we have a secure facility and people have to ring in to get access. That's okay. I apologize. So we bought the, the supplies to do an edible aquifer for the fifth graders, and I tell you what, once we did that project once, the word spread like wildfire. So every event that we had when we were holding our uh, stormwater community cleanup day, we did the edible aquifer. When, when the kids, um, at the end of the school year, they would, uh, we, they would do a student-led uh, community water education day where the students would teach the community members uh, about water quality do, using their own projects. They did the edible aquifer there. We would have advisor group meetings. We hold edible aquifers there. Tell you what, you give kids um, sugar and um, something to eat, and you have their attention from here on out. So we learned that that was um, a very successful project for us. The um, middle schoolers, we targeted um, groundwater models where they incorporated uh, groundwater knowledge in there and how stormwater affected it. That was very beneficial. We took the, they took the groundwater models to different events, and we did kid, uh, summer camps for kids in action. Um, they really loved those. And it was something they could see, something tangible they could put their fingers on. And the high school kids, you know, sometimes it's hard to keep their attention. So what we did is we, we bought them wetsuits and uh, snorkel gear, um, and we put them out in the, in the local water body in back of the high school. They, as you can see in the picture, they have nets, and they're, uh, we have local fish and game out there. They're uh, shocking the fish, taking them out, putting them in aquariums. Kids get hands on, um, and so while we are um, a addressing the younger community, we also have a lot of uh, younger Hispanic uh, students that um, we submit information through the school district, and they take it home and go through with the parents because they're excited about what they did. They're excited about their project, so they take it home. Uh, we do uh, supply uh, stipends for the teachers uh, for their time. And then we do supply money for their um, supplies. And we, we let the school district determine what kind of supplies that they want. But the students get excited, and they, and they go home and spread the word to their family. So we feel we kind of got a double bang for a buck there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Um, the results, uh, we, we have a bilingual stormwater website, which uh, I have mentioned earlier. If anybody interested in looking at it, if you type in Google City of Napa or cityofnapa.us and uh, go to departments and uh, environmental compliance, uh, you can see our website. It is bilingual. That was a direct um, result of a grant that we got through EPA. The initial urban waters grant we received, uh, EPA liked the activities that we did. We received an additional $20,000 in environmental justice grant where we were able to move our projects forward. Um, and just here recently, we did receive $45,000 in an EPA contract to go ahead and do an interpretive signage project that's bilingual. Um, that project is shown on the screen there. We have the signs devised. Uh, our project is going out to be installed and should be completed here this spring, so we're pretty excited. We're going to install this project in one of the local parks in our target area, which is predominantly Hispanic. So um, our program is just getting started, and we're very excited. We've uh, received notice from the Hispanic community that they're very appreciative of the fact that we're involving them in, in the process. I know a lot of the communities, um, like Alberto was talking about, you know, you have a larger community that, that gets involved. Here in Nampa, the, the Hispanic and Latino community hasn't really been involved in, in in advance lately, Stormwater is one of the first um, city entities to actually be actively go out and pursue involvement from the um, Hispanic community. So uh, we just we just feel really fortunate that we've had this opportunity that was provided by EPA that we could initiate this project and move forward with this project. And if anybody's interested, uh, if anybody attends Stormcom uh, conference. In August, I will be presenting uh, this project in a lot more detail at one of the um, uh, presentations there. I believe it's like August 5th. So if anybody sees mm -hmm. me out there and say, hey, I heard you talking on, on the, the webinar, come up and say hi to me, and, and we'll chat. Any Great. questions? Great. There's a question here. Um, please type in your questions. But um, Sun, what what is, what is an edible aquifer? I'm sure she's asking for a lot of us who don't know the term. Edible aquifer. Uh, we provide the children with a uh, plastic see-through cup, and uh, we have an, a, a series of ingredients that um, represent different materials in an aquifer. We have uh, marshmallows and cereal, like cocoa cereal, and we have chocolate sprinkles, and we use ice cream, and we use Seven Up for water, and we construct this aquifer layer by layer, as you would see them in the, in the earth, and then at the end we we uh, take a straw and we punch it in the edible aquifer like we're drilling a well, and we the, we end it with the kids get a spoon a spoon and they get to put in as much red Kool-Aid as they want. They want to put a little in, they want to put a lot in. We tell them that the Kool-Aid represents pollution. And the more Kool-Aid to put in, the more red ends up in your aquifer at the bottom. And we tell them this is what you drink when you, when you drink your water out of the well. So it's just kind of a visual educational tool that the kids really like because they get to eat it at the end. Mm. And I think um, if anybody's interested in that project, uh, I know I got uh, the project off the Idaho DEQ website, and it has step-by-step -step instructions on, on how you can um, construct an edible aquifer. Now, if you're going to do it out in the field like we do with our uh, water clean up, uh, stormwater cleanup days, you kind of have to be careful of the logistics because you don't want melty ice cream and melty ice. <laughs> it's kind of one of those. You know, it gets warm here in the fall and the spring, so <laughs> we have to make Great. sure we're close so we can do a store run. Great. And I see Hannah just posted a link there on the chat box um, so we can follow that. That's great. Um, a question from Tamara. How does one engage folks who are working with low-income residents in her project as ag workers? How do you get them to value watershed stormwater protection when they barely have enough food or enough to buy food, pay the rent, et cetera. Um, great question. 
Well, how? And I would open that up, Beverly, Alberto, and Cheryl, all three of you. Um, what well, are the messages that resonate when, when there's bigger basic needs that are not being met in those communities? How we've gotten the, the word out and try to encourage um, involvement with the low-income families. Um, we, we tend events that provide services to the, the lower-income people. We've uh, gone to, um, well, they call it Labor Appreciation Day, but it's a lot of the immigrant farm workers who come in. Uh, in Nampa's predominantly an agricultural area where we get a lot of transient farm workers coming in and out. And there's events where they provide food and information on health care and everything like that. We go to these events and, you know, we, we hand out the bilingual material. We hand out, we give out um, giveaways like backpacks and, you know, colors and things for the kids to have which have our logo on. And we just talk with them. Um, we just talk with them on, on the basic level, you know, do you own a pet? Well, when your pet goes outside, do you clean up after your pet? Or do you like to fish? Or something. We try to find something on their level and make them appreciate what they have and want to keep stuff clean. Um, I guess we just appeal to, to the basic, mm -hmm. basic needs and wants. Yeah. And one of the, the approaches that we've found to be most effective is really trying to connect ourselves as much as possible to those neighborhood organizations. And usually you're part of a larger agenda that, that has agenda items that really do have immediate interest in them, whether it's crime in their neighborhood or you know, opportunities for affordable housing. And if you're part of, if you're one of those agenda items, you have a sort of a captive audience there yes. and they've taken time out of their schedule to attend. And one of the things that we found in Lowell with the Cambodian community, and I, I think Alberto talked about this a bit, is that many of them fish in the river. And they're not just fishing for recreation. It's, it's actually you know, part of their way of supplying food for their family. Mm -hmm. And we have problems with some of those on time to time water quality in the river. So making them understand that what they are doing in their day to day lives that impacts stormwater is also making the quality of the water in the river better and therefore the, the fish is healthier to eat is sort of an important connection for them. So if you can find a way to, to tie their interests to, um, to the river or to water quality in terms of how they are personally impacted, it, has, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. I agree. I'm going to echo, you know, and I'm not sure if it was uh, 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 Cheryl talking or Beverly um, just recently, but um, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm re I really appreciate that someone brought this question up. Um, you know, I mentioned that I'm actually a recent immigrant to the United States, right? I'm from Honduras, and uh, it's um, when I first started with the job. Sometimes I felt a little bit of like a hypocrite, trying to kind of like push my agenda somehow. Uh, understanding, you know, growing up, you know, in a middle class, lower middle class family, you know, where we you know, when I was growing up, had lots of difficulties, you know, f with with providing food. My parents, you know, were having difficulties uh, providing food and, uh, you know, having enough money to pay for school and medicines and things like that. But, um, you know, it is, it, it's been easier for me uh, to make a connection because I think I, I've lived some of these difficulties, you know, personally, uh, firsthand, and I think there's a connection there, you know, that people know that. At the same time, though, um, you know, it, you need to relate it to other things that are more important to them and more immediate, you know, like PCBs and arsenic and dioxins and PAHs are not visible in the Duwamish River, right? What's visible, it's, you know, a, actually clean looking river, you know, compared to some of the rivers where we come from, that actually has fish. You know, my hometown river in Honduras doesn't have fish because it's so polluted um, with raw sewage mainly. So you can actually smell the pollution. Uh, you don't have to see it. So, um, you know, relating that, you know, your goals and objectives with something that's more immediate and visible to them, uh, like health, you know, I think I mentioned a little bit, you know, when I was presenting that the RCC has um, done some healthy communities projects, you know, and we're looking into, and excuse me, because I have a cough, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, um, you know, looking into uh, getting funding for, uh, to address air pollution or 
to increase green space and other things, you know, that are not related, directly related to the Superfund site and toxic sediment cleanup. But, you know, the community, actually, you build that trust by listening, you know, to them, you know, this is a concern, you know, and if they don't have the means to get money, us as an organization, you know, can't find some funding and, you know, we can contract with other people or, you know, uh, award grants to community groups that can target some of these um, issues or address some of these issues. Um, and uh, so, you know, again, someone mentioned, I think, uh, the first presentation that tie it to their children and their grandchildren. And, you know, when you tell them this is how it's going to affect your children if they keep on living here or this is how it affects their health or how they cannot go and play at the public beach, you know, at the park because it has high levels of arsenic and this is what's going to happen to them or might happen, you know, you, you can never tell, you know, uh, or direct or link, you know, like causes and effects directly, but um, it's, it's about what's important to them, listening and, and trying to deliver some of the results, show them that you've, um, you've listened and done something about it, and then when you try to tell them about toxic sediment cleanup, they will be there to support you. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question, and I guess I would ask anybody who is on the call, um, you know, to some extent, every community is left to figure out what messages resonate locally, but I do wonder if anybody knows of polling information that is uh, that is targeted, you know, whether it's Hispanic community or other um, minority communities to identify those messages that resonate. And I don't know if EPA has, has invested in any of that kind of information. I know... Um, some have been done around like ge particular geographies like uh, post BP oil disaster. There were there was a lot of polling done to look at the Vietnamese fishermen populations and how they responded. Um, so I don't know if folks know of anything along those lines. That seems like it would be a very useful uh, resource um, so that not everybody is having to do the sort of ground truthing of their messages like Beverly, you all did in Massachusetts. And I don't know if even any of you who have done it came across any resources that would be useful along those lines. There's nothing that we have come across. Mm -hmm. um, we did do a little bit of research in terms of the, the Southeast Asian community and whether that was something that had been investigated. And there was it was more of a Googling exercise, but there was nothing that we could, could find that reflected that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, this is Alberto again. Um, we haven't uh, found any of that information, and how we've actually, I think, addressed that um, issue is that we contract uh, with community members, you know, uh, like let's say with the Vietnamese community, I contract someone from the neighborhood, you know, to help me do outreach. So he knows the community and the culture better than I do, uh, and he knows what the message will be, you know, the, the most efficient message or how to put it. Um, so that's how actually we've worked with, and uh, you know, we also contract with another person, you know, from South Park that does uh, outreach, helps me with the outreach with the Latino community, uh, that she's lived there for uh, several years. So, so that helps out. Uh, I haven't had to do any research on how to do the messaging for the specific community groups or minority groups. Mm -hmm. And that certainly seems to be a theme with Hoka, I think you said her name was, Cheryl, um, just having credible voices <laughs> representing, um, you know, your, your mission and your, your goals to those communities. Um, and she is well respected. I've seen, uh, you know, like local farm workers go up to her and, and also we've had uh, communication with the Mexican consulate in, in Boise. And so she's just a tremendous liaison for mm -hmm. the, that she is well respected within her community. Mm -hmm. Let me open it up. Do folks have other um, either um, something they want to share about their efforts locally, or other strategies that have worked, or or existing challenges that you're facing as you're doing this? Um, oh, Amy. Um, Amy just posted a useful uh, fostering sustainable behavior listserv. Excellent. Um, yeah, because really sustainable behavior is what we're talking about. Um, anybody else have um, resources or tools that they found helpful? Um, I know Cheryl has posted um, some of her bilingual materials on Basecamp already. 
and we'll certainly be working with Beverly to do the same. And as you um, finalize that training for trainers guide, Beverly, it would be great to share that. Um, but I don't know if others have um, suggestions for tools that folks dealing with this issue, trying to make headway, might find useful. All right. Okay. Um, so, so you know, I don't want to just like uh, drive the conversation here. This is Alberto again. Uh, you know, my presentation is very focused on the public comment period of um, last year's public comment period. But you know, there's other things that we've done uh, over the 12 years that we've been working with the community to engage them. You know, and one of the things that comes to mind that has been extremely, it's maybe our most efficient uh, outreach, you know, community engagement. Uh, tool or event is the Duwamish River Festival or the Festival del Rio Duwamish that we put together every year. I know someone mentioned that you know going to those festivals and having a booth and a table it's amazing. Um, but we host it annually, you know, in um, during the summertime, and we invite you know community groups and agencies and other groups, you know, nonprofits that work in the area, and. Uh, you know, it's another way in which the communities can actually talk to agencies and representatives and local elected officials in, a, in an informal way, you know, not having to go to downtown Seattle and step in, you know, stand up and give testimony in front of like 100 people, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it gives opportunity for agency representatives and local elected officials to actually see the faces of the communities that they uh, serve, right? Um, so, you know, one of the things, one, I think last year we had over 200, 200 no, sorry, 200, 2,000 people, like 45 different groups, you know, including EPA, Ecology, King County, the city, you know, the port, Boeing, you know, which is one of the responsible parties. And um, and it's amazing, you know, we have performers, you know, um, performing, you know, d dances and music, you know, for, that represent the diverse cultures of the Duwamish Valley. And um, and it's amazing, you know, having, getting 2,000 people there and, you know, knowing, figuring out an activity in which they visit, you know, the, the, the different tables, and talk to the agencies um, and the community groups and the nonprofit is, is amazing. Um, and you know, of course, you know, multilingual brochures and posters and flyers and things like that that we've used before. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Yeah, you guys are doing great. <laughs> all three of you. I just want to um, similar event. I want to thank all three of you for um, not just presenting today, but for the amazing work that you do, given the resources, uh, limited resources you all have. Um, another idea from Hannah, a similar festival here um, on the Columbia Slough Watershed Council, annual bilingual paddling and dance event. What a great combo, explorando. Um, that sounds great. Um, Diana? I, yes. Is that this Amy? This is Jennifer from EPA okay. Region 7 in Kansas City. Please. And uh, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Uh, it sounds like, uh, you know, similar projects here in our area, uh, both from our grants and from other types of funding, that, that having the key person within the community is the number one necessity. We often call it a spark plug. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'm hearing is that it's about being in the right place, so finding those festivals or those community events to get the connections. Mm -hmm. The third thing I'm hearing is there needs to be an incentive after that, so you've got the right person, they're guiding you to the community, they get you to the event, but how do you get the people engaged? And I'm hearing things like handing out backpacks and getting involved in uh, outdoor events. I know that there's been some concerns that some funding sources limit use of funds for those type of things. Mm -hmm. Have you been able to find other ways, like other partners, other sponsors, that will offer those kind of things for you? Mm. Good question. Anybody? I know food uh, limitations, there's all kinds of limitations sometimes with the funding sources. How have you worked around those? Well, I know the, the giveaways that, uh, this is Cheryl, the giveaways that I have, I, I just budget for in my budget, um, you know, to get the word out there to, to a city who's never had a stormwater permit before, um, you know, I, I have to be able to justify that this is the stuff that I need, um, 
and this is what I need to get the word out there and, and to comply. So um, I, I pretty much have to fight for, for everything that I get, but I, I try to be smart in what I choose to make sure that whoever gets it will actually use it. Mm -hmm. You know, we've given away backpacks, we've given away lunch lunch um, containers, you know, like lunch boxes and stuff like that. But it needs to be something that the kids will use, the adults will use, uh, not just something they'll put aside. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard, but you can do it. Mm -hmm. And project partners, so yeah, like city municipalities might have more leeway like Cheryl's does, even if it's not easy. Um, and we've been trying to foster some more um, um, community partners within the community that um, some of the like local lawn and garden places, some of the s smaller businesses, you know, it's a good opportunity for them. So we've been out trying to foster a lot of partnerships that help us with this. Yeah, and it sounds yeah. like um, a few that are suggested here on the comment box. Uh, engineering firms that have stormwater focus can help with food. Um, other corporate sponsors, it sounds like um, up in the Columbia Slough, there's also lots of in-kind donations that Hannah's yeah. delivering. And, and I would add, you know, like, uh, yes, be smart about it. Um, budget it, you know, in your budget if you can include it. Also develop a really good relationship with uh, the people that you work with, you know, your grant managers. Um, you know, I know that, you know, at the beginning, we wouldn't get food, you know, EPA wouldn't pay for food for some of our public meetings and hearings. And, you know, after they, we convinced them and, you know, they saw the results when we paid for it, they were willing, you know, we have a really good relationship with our, with our people at EPA and ecology. Uh, and um, sometimes fight for it. You know, I had a, a, a not as an amazing experience with our um, a person from EPA last year. They didn't want to provide food for one of my public meetings, and I had to tell them, you know, okay, I'm going to set a stand outside of my event and in the rain and in the cold, and when I give a Vietnamese sandwich to every person, I'm going to let them know they can't eat outside because you are not allowing them to. Um, and they had to cave in, you know. Um, so work with them, you know, most of the time they get it, they know it, um, they're willing to help you. And sometimes there's interesting and creative ways, you know, going around or bending the rules and, and making sure that you can you can get those incentives um, to the community because that's another way of empowering the community, you know, and to let them know you really appreciate their expertise and their time by just giving something, you know, small, but the community does appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I know when I do my stormwater community cleanup day, uh, we did partner uh, with Walmart. Walmart is a big uh, environmental um, advocate, and they provide employees that help clean up the area. They provide all the food for our um, our appreciation lunch, our volunteer appreciation lunch. So if you can find a, um, a you know a corporation or a business like that in your community. You know, a lot of them are just looking for places to um, to help out with. Mm -hmm. um, or they just want to look good. Yeah, they want they want to look good and they want to help out and they really want to really want to be involved in their community. So we've had uh, a lot of luck with uh, like with Walmart, and we have to I have to give them a lot of kudos for supporting us through the last few years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, with that, I'm going to um, I just want to share. As I said, um, this is the first of a number of webinars that we're planning, where again, it's like case studies and discussions. Um, we have another one planned for next week, if you can join. Um, we're going to run all the registrations through the same URL, which is there at the bottom, and you all should have gotten through uh, Basecamp. But it's the many forms of community-based education, and I know Tamara is going to be um, joining as uh, from the California Coastal Commission and presenting their project, as is um, uh, Galveston Bay, Charlene uh, from the Galveston Bay Foundation and Earth Force, a group that's working nationally doing um, education and outreach. So uh, please join us. We will be recording all of these sessions and we'll make them available. I'll put up the link here on Basecamp as soon as it's available. But um, uh, keep an eye out for the materials that we can upload. Um, I will be following up also with uh, Sun. If there's anything we can put up in terms of transportation services that are provided by EPA, that might be also very helpful. So with that, thank you to our three speakers, um, Beverly, Alberto, and Cheryl, and thanks to all of you for joining. Um, we do have, uh, as soon as we close the room here in a second, 
Many of you will be routed directly to a quick evaluation form. Some of you, because of firewalls, maybe don't get there, but you'll see the link here on the left side in the chat box. Just please, if you could take a minute to, to fill that out, uh, give us feedback as we plan more of these. So again, thank you all. Um, I see a lot of you are saying goodbye. It is our pleasure, and uh, hopefully we'll talk next week. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.